Welcome to this session on light, which is part of Unit 8. Now in this session we will we'll be looking at the following aspects. First we will have a brief review of what we have learnt so far in the earlier classes. We will have a very brief introduction. Then we will start with dispersion and spectrum. We will discuss about the two experiments that Newton conducted in this context. We will we'll find out or we will try to investigate what, is, what causes dispersion in the first place. Then we will talk about pure spectrum, we will talk about impure spectrum and then we will have a brief discussion about the visible spectrum, the range of colors or the range we have for visible spectrum. We will also look into spectroscope and then the uses of spectroscope and finally we will look at what is known as Raman effect. So these are the topics that we are going to cover in this particular session. Now to start with, when I do a review of what you learned, let us recapitulate or let us recap what we have learned so far about light in the previous sessions or in the previous classes. Now the first thing that we know is light is a form of energy. Uh, in, in the previous unit, in unit 7, we said that heat is a form of energy, light is also another form of energy. So light is a form of energy and light also travels in straight lines. So light is a form of energy and it travels in straight lines and light has uh, <coughs> undergoes a phenomena called reflection and refraction. So refraction of a light, refraction of light is caused by change of velocity of light in different media. So light has got different velocities in different media. So light travels at a specific velocity in vacuum, it travels at a different velocity in uh, let's say water. So there is a difference in velocities of light in different media. So refraction is a phenomenon that is caused because of variation in velocity of light in different media. And now the refractive index of a medium, we define the refractive index of a medium as the velocity of light in vacuum to the velocity of light in the specific medium. So that's what is we define as a refractive index. Now we also saw that composite light, composite light when passed through prism will split up into its constituent colors. And we also know well, from our practical experience that a rainbow is a spectrum that is formed by nature. So we see sometimes a rainbow in the sky that is equal to a spectrum or that is a spectrum that is uh, formed in nature. And now let's um, um, after this brief review of what, whatever you have learned so far in the earlier sessions or earlier classes, let's move on to the next topic and have a brief introduction. Now, this introduction, um, we, we know that um, even uh, people in earlier life, they knew that, they observed that when, sun, when a composite light like sunlight, for example, fo falls on transparent colored material or transparent um, uh, colorless crystals, when composite light falls on colorless transparent crystals, the output or the beam of light that comes out from the transparent colored crystal is having different colors. The output consists the, the beam of light that emerges out of the colorless transparent crystals as having different colors. So this was a, uh, this was a phenomenon, this was something that was observed by ancient people or ancient men. Now, we, we are going to look into, after this brief introduction, we are going to look into the aspect of why exactly it happens so. And that is what we are going to cover now in the context of dispersion and spectrum. We will also look into the Newton's, the two experiments that Newton did in this context. Now, let's come back to this uh, diagram which, uh, which, 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 which uh, has a prism at the center here and there is a slit here, a narrow small pole a cardboard and there is a sunlight that is coming in here so sunlight is passed through this hole it falls onto this prism and we know that this prism the some mechanism splits this composite color into its constituent colors so if I have a screen on the other side of the prism I would get these colors this band of colors here so I would have violet at one end and red at the other end. The order in which these colors occur can be remembered by remembering the term with gyal. So violet, you get violet here, you get indigo here, you get blue here, 
you get green, yellow, orange and red. So this is this is the order in which you get the light, you get you get the colored band it's always. Now this order is the same that you would get in a rainbow. So this order is the same that you would get in rainbow. And now the question is the phenomena you know, so let, let's put it this way now when we talk in terms of dispersion what is it we mean by dispersion so the phenomena let us define dispersion now the phenomena by which a composite light the phenomena by which a composite light is split into its constituent colors is called dispersion so dispersion can be defined as phenomena by which composite light is split or dispersed into its constituent colors when I say constituent it means that if I have a composite light the sunlight which consists of these colors combination of these colors the composite light is this what is falling in on this prism and the constituent colors of these these form this particular color that's how we make a distinction here so dispersion is a phenomenon where, wherein composite light is split or dispersed into its constituent colors and the medium that brings about this dispersion is called the dispersive medium so in this case the prism is a dispersive medium the prism is a dispersive medium so let, let me uh, repeat that once again if I have an arrow beam of composite light falling on a prism this prism will split this narrow beam of composite light into its constituent colors so if I have a screen on the other side of this prism and if I make a, a composite light fall onto that then I would get a spectrum of colors or a band of colors on the screen here and this ray and this colors would be starting at violet to the red color so it's I can remember these colors by the term whip gear so I have violet, I have indigo, I have blue, I have green, yellow, orange and red and this is the same order in which I would find the colors split up on the rainbow which is a natural phenomenon so the, the phenomena of dispersion can be defined as dispersion is a phenomena in which composite light composite light is split up into its constituent colors the medium that brings about this dispersion is called a dispersive medium so prism in this case or glass in this case is a dispersive medium so this is what we have seen so far now now the other aspect that you need to remember is the band of colors the band of colors that I obtain here is called the spectrum so spectrum the band of colors or wavelength obtained by dispersion of a composite light of a narrow beam of composite light so in this case an arrow beam of composite light is falling on this medium which disperses these colors so the band of colors that I obtain here the band of colors that I obtain here is called the spectrum he said the spectrum is this narrow beam, beam of narrow band of colors that I obtain on this screen 
this is the incident composite light, this is the dispersive medium and the phenomena of splitting of this composite light to its constituent light, constituent colors is called dispersion. So after having seen briefly about dispersion and dispersive media, let's move on to the two experiments that let's have a discussion about the two experiments that Newton did in this context. So the first So what Newton did basically was that he took a he wanted to find out Newton wanted to find out if these colors are indeed got from this composite color. So the experiment he did was he sent this composite he sent this narrow beam of white light or composite or composite light onto a prism and when he split that color he placed another prism on the other side of that. So this incident color, band of colors or the spectra was made to fall on another prism and then he wanted, he observed what happens to the other end of that um, uh, prism. So this is, uh, this is how the experiment setup looks like. So I have, a, I have a narrow beam of light coming in here and then I have a prism. This prism splits that color into Now he placed another prism here with the inverted prism so This is a screen. So this is what Newton conducted two experiments in this context. The first experiment was to, was to see if this composite colors, if, if this composite color is the one that is producing this band of colors. So what he did was, he, played, he took a prism and he set a narrow beam of light, composite light onto this and then this on the other side of that, after this, he got this, he got this color split up, he placed an inverted prism on the other side of that. So this, this composite band of colors was made to fall on this prism and he wanted to see what he would get on the other side of that and true to his expectation, he did get a white light on the other side of that. So you have an incident composite light coming in here, incident composite white light which split up into the constituent colors and this uh, uh, prism combined all these colors and you got a white light on the other side of that, white beam on the other side. So if I place a screen, I would find white light on the other side. So this proved that this prism is not something that is manufacturing these colors but it is an incident, incident light that is getting split in this case. So Newton was able to prove that the composite light is the one that gets split into different colors by using this combination and by conducting this experiment. So in this case, the incident light is white and what he got on the other side of this prism is again white. Thereby he showed that it is not the prism that is manufacturing some colors but it is something that is inherent or constituent of this composite light. Now the other experiment Newton did was to find out if this light, this, the light that, that the colors that he got got on the other side or, or, uni, or something that cannot that can be split further up. So what he did was we will see the setup that he had there. So he, had, he took a narrow beam of light made it to fall on he made this to fall on So he made this to fall on So 
So you have the, all these colors here, violet, with gear, so So what he did was he just took this green light itself, just the green light, just the green portion of that. So he placed another slit here. So Newton conducted this experiment to see if this the color, the band of colors that he got here could be subsequently split. So what he did was he took, he, this is experiment one, which proved that, which proved that the colors that Newton obtained here were indeed from, coming from this composite color, by the dispersion of the composite color. The second experiment is to prove that each one of these colors here cannot be split up much any further. So what he did was he took a narrow beam of light made to fall on the prism and he selected one of the colors, one of the color, one of the band of colors here, he selected green and at that particular place he made a small hole there so that only green light coming out of this prism could pass through this screen. So then he made that light to fall on another prism. The idea was that if this, if this light could be split much further, you would find another band of colors over here. But what he observed was that on the other side, there was just a band of color corresponding band corresponding to green, and not as not as separate, not any other colors. So, if you select only green here and make that make that to fall on a prism, what you find here is just a green band. If you selected red, you would get only green band, red band. This shows that the colors that you got, the band of colors that you got here on the other side after dispersion is something that cannot be split up any further. These are the two experiments that Newton conducted. So let us look at what causes dispersion in the first place. So when you say dispersion it is splitting up of this color, splitting up of this composite light into its constituent colors. Now there is an explanation given here says that the refractive index the refractive index of this medium is the refractive media uh, index is different for different colors. So the refractive index of this medium or any medium for that matter is different for different colors, and that is the reason you find the, ref the uh, amount of refraction that uh, that each color undergoes is different, and this explains why you get this dispersion in the first place. So violet has got a different, this medium has got a different refractive index for violet as compared to red. And that is the reason this, this beam of light, uh, the amount of uh, refraction it undergoes is different for different colors resulting in a band of colors on the other side of the screen. So the refractive index of a medium is slightly different for different colors uh, passing through the prism. And various colors are, are refracted by slightly different amounts. Dispersion is just caused on account of different ref refractive index indices of the medium for different colors and this explains why you would get this color on the other side. Now after having discussed about uh, the Newton's experiments and the cause of dispersion, let us look at what is pure spectrum, what is impure spectrum and what is visible spectrum. Now, now basically what happens in this case, if I, if I take this example, this is a simplified diagram. Now assuming that this slit or the hole that I have made here is, is not, obviously it, is, it cannot be a pinpoint. So there is a, there is a finite thick, um, uh, radius to this one. So
so to this hole so what happens is there is one narrow beam of light that is falling here and then if I, if I exaggerate this slightly this is how I would get it so I have a prism here so there is one light falling here which gets split up into its constituent color on the other side and now there is another beam of light that is falling slightly at an angle here there is another beam of light that is slightly falling here there is another beam of light that is slightly falling here so each one of these incident rays gets split up into its, uh, its, into its constituent colors so this ray gives for example ray 1, ray 2, ray 3, ray 4 assuming that I can split them up then I will get ray 1 to violet 1 and again I will get a different band here a different band here and things like that so basically what is happening here in this case is although I am saying that this is a narrow beam of light still some part of the light is incident on this particular portion some particular and some narrow beam of light is falling on some other medium and this undergoes different refractions because the, real, the angle of incidence is different so this spectrum cannot be a pure spectrum in the sense I cannot have just a band which says this is violet and it's a clear cut demarcation of this is indigo, this is a blue and stuff like that so it would be a mixed it would be a mixed band of colors there with slight uh, deviations here and there so this is what is known as impure spectrum so this is what we call it as impure spectrum because these colors get slightly overlapped one on top one on the other so you don't get a pure green or pure blue or pure red there it's a combination of colors because this uh, rays the, the, the rays that get formed because of these rays getting incident on different angles will overlap slightly so this is what we call as an impure spectrum so an impure spectrum is one where the colors overlap now as opposed to this this is the way Newton did, conducted his experiment because uh, this is the easiest and the simplest way of doing it we just choose a pinhole, we just have a pinhole here pass a ray of light and we get this colors on that side this is an impure spectrum as opposed to that we can always get an, a pure spectrum if you use a refined process which we will be seeing subsequently uh, a pure spectrum uh, let, let's look at how we get a pure spectrum in the subsequent session when we talk in terms of spectroscope but a pure spectrum as opposed to impure spectrum should have a clear cut demarcation to say that this is blue, this is green, this is yellow, this is that means this ray of light that is falling should be horizontal in nature or just one beam of light should be going in there so either it should be horizontal in nature so the narrow beam of light all of them in the same uh, direction and you cannot have something like that coming in if you have rays falling in at different angles then you would get an impure spectrum if you have rays falling at the same angle then you would get a visible pure spectrum so how to obtain pure spectrum is a topic that we will discuss subsequently now let us look at visible spectrum So we are going to discuss about the visible spectrum, say what is the range of colors that we have. So visible light lies in the ray lies in the wavelength region of about 400 nanometer to 750 nanometer so if I want to draw a graph for the x along the x, di x direction then this would be 400 nanometers I have 500 nanometer here I have 600 nanometer here have 700 here and then I have 750 over here and this side is infrared and 
this side is ultraviolet rays. Now I have uh, violet here, indigo, and then blue, blue from here to here, and etc. On the other side, I would have red. So you can refer to your textbook uh, to find out where exactly the demarcations are. But this is how it would look like. So the range is from 400 nanometers to 750 nanometers. On this, this end would be violet and this end would be red. So around 750 would be red and around 400 nanometers would be violet. Note that anything beyond the red is going to be infrared and anything below violet is going to be ultraviolet. So just remember these terms, violet and red. So anything on the other side of that is infrared, anything on the, on the, on the lower side of this is ultraviolet. So this is how you can remember that. And this goes in order, violet, whip gear, violet, indigo, blue, etc. to red. This is about the visible uh, light, the range of uh, uh, frequencies or wavelengths for visible light. Now after having seen about visible light, let us move on to the next topic called spectroscope. A spectroscope <coughs> so this is a schematic diagram of a spectroscope a spectroscope is an instrument that is used to obtain a pure spectrum remember we were talking about pure impure and visible spectrum earlier we said that pure spectrum is the one where we have the colors, the band of colors distinctly um, marked. Means there is no overlap of colors in the spectrum. So to obtain a pure spectrum, this is how we could do that one. We use an instrument or a device called a spectroscope. So a spectroscope is a device or an instrument that is used for obtaining pure spectrum. So this is how a pure a spectroscope, a diagram of a pure spectrum of a spectroscope would look like. So this pretty similar to what we had earlier. This is a slit where you have an incident composite light is falling on and we have this this portion is called a collimator and this portion is called a telescope. So we have a collimator on one side of the spectroscope and we have a telescope on the other side. So this combination as, as it is is called a spectroscope. So light is incident on this. So imagine that there is one ray of light is falling on this, uh, this angle and there is another light falling on this angle. We have a lens arrangement over here on which this light falls. This lens arrangement makes the light to be parallel to one another. So these rays are now parallel although the incident lights are at different angles. The lights that are emerging out of this collimator are always parallel. So this parallel beam of light falls on a prism and then this prism splits that because of dispersion and we have a range of, uh, we have a band of colors that fall on the uh, lens system over here again which concentrates specific colors on specific uh, points on this eyepiece. This is the eyepiece. So if, if I view from my eye, if I view this from my eye, the band of colors is amplified and I get a bigger image of this dispersion. So this is how I would get that. I would use a spectroscope. So a spectroscope is an instrument that helps me in obtaining pure spectrum. Why is it that pure spectrum is important? Now let us see why it is important when we look at uses of spectroscope. So let me uh, uh, ref repeat what I said now. So a spectroscope consists of a collimator, a telescope and a prism. So light when it is incident on a collimator falls on, an eye, falls on a lens system which concentrates and which makes the lens which makes the rays of light go in parallel so as opposed to it being scattered the ray of light is now parallel and it falls on a prism this prism splits these colors splits this ray of light into its 
respective constituent color and then that light falls on uh, the telescope on the lens system of the telescope which con which uh, uh, which concentrates them onto this eyepiece and and amplifies that signal so when I look from my eye into the eyepiece I find the pure spectrum in my sight so instead of uh, uh, looking at this uh, spectrum or pure spectrum from my from my eyes directly if I place a, a film here I would call this entire arrangement as a spectrograph so a spectrograph is nothing but a spectroscope but the only thing is the only difference is that the, the image that I get instead of my seeing that physically from my eye I am going to take that image on a film media and so study that subsequently that's how I would uh, have a spectro, spectrograph so that's the difference between a spectroscope and a spectrograph a spectrograph has a film media at the uh, for the screen whereas a spectroscope has got um, an arrangement where you know, I can look into the look into the telescope here and see the spectrum and remember that the spectroscope produces a pure spectrum now let us look at um, the uses of a spectroscope let us now look at the uses of spectroscope now there are four different types of uh, Now, after having stated about spectroscope, let us look at some of the uses of spectroscope as we mentioned earlier. Now, when we use um, um, sunlight or um, light from molten iron or some other sources, we find that the spectra or the range of colors that we obtain is continuous in nature. That means we have all the colors there and then it is continuous, there is no bands, everything is continuous. Whereas, as opposed to that, we have something called line emission spectrum, absorption spectrum, light spectrum and turn off for lines. Let us look at each one of these in some detail now. So the first thing we are going to look at is a line emission spectrum. So in talking terms of line emission spectrum, so let us imagine that instead of using a candle light, instead of using a candle light or instead of using sunlight, we use a different source. Now let us say the source that is used is mercury. That means, for example, I have I have mercury filled in here. And I have a strong electrical signal given to these plates with mercury internally inside the sealed chamber. Then what I would get is a line emission spectrum from mercury. So I would get mercury source emission from mercury so if I observe if I take this as a source and then observe through my spectroscope and if I um, observe using a spectroscope what I would get is a line emission spectrum so this is a line typical line emission spectrum where I have got distinct lines there distinct bands over there or distinct lines for mercury so what is um, so specific about that is if I change this from mercury to something else, let us say sodium, then what I would get here is a different band of is a different set of lines. So these lines effectively, or the location of these lines and the pattern of that lines identify or tell me what is the source that I am using to obtain this spectra. So this spectra is something that is unique to the uh, gas or the vapor that I am using here. So if I use mercury, this is what this is the pattern I am going to get. If I use sodium, there is a different pattern that I am going to get. So by observing the spectrograph, I can tell what is the source for this particular spectra. So let us imagine I am getting, let us assume that I get this particular pattern coming from some source and I don't know what is that source, then by looking at this source, I can say either it is mercury or it is sodium or whatever it is based on my previous knowledge. So this is the way this line emission spectrum is very useful 
in spectrograph in spectro yes this this uh, uh, this mechanism or this uh, area or this field of identifying from where uh, what is the object from which the so what is the source from which I am getting the spectrum and to also say what is the intensity or what is the concentration in the source is what is known as spectrochemical analysis. So spectrochemical analysis is a mechanism or is a phenomenon by which or is a, is a mechanism or a study which tells me what is the source for my spectra, what is the source for my spectra and also tells me what is the concentration in the source. For example, if these lines are very intense, the first thing that you need to observe is if these lines are very intense, that tells me that the concentration of mercury is more. If the lines are weak, then it tells me the concentration of mercury from the source is, weak, is less. So by analyzing the intensity of these lines and by knowing the pattern of these lines, I know the source for this and I know the concentration of this. This helps me in identifying the elements or materials that are available in my source. So this is about line emission spectrum. Note that in the line emission spectrum, these lines tell me what is the source or what, what the source contains. For example, it contains mercury or it contains um, um, sodium or whatever it is. So this pattern tells me what is the source and the intensity of these lines tell me what is the concentration of the, um, of the element over there. Now as opposed to line emission, let us look at absorption spectrum. And now the other thing we need to know is if I pass ray of light, if I, pa if I pass an incident ray of light onto a transparent medium, onto a transparent colored medium and observe the spectra and observe the spectra, then I would get an absorption spectrum. In this case, as a band of color band of color is missing here which becomes dark so this color pertaining to this transparent medium becomes dark this is what we call as absorption spectrum so you get a spectrum but there is a band of colors that is missing or that is dark this is absorption spectrum by looking at the absorption spectrum I can tell what is the intervening material through which the source is coming so by looking at this absorption spectrum it helps me now the next item we are going to look at is line absorption spectrum now this is the case of uh, sodium. So in this case, what happens is if I have a if I have a source which is emitting um, colors uh, all the colors, and if I pass that through sodium, if I pass that through sodium vapor and analyze the spectrum of the emergent light, then I would find there are some lines that are oh that um, I'm sorry that would be the absorption spectrum. That, uh, that is the absorption spectrum. Now let us look at line absorption spectrum. So let's look at the line absorption spectrum once again. So what happens is if I have a if I have a source of light, a white light. Now let us say from carbon arc lamp and pass that through and through a medium that has sodium and I observe the spectra that is coming out of that medium then what I would find is that two distinct lines would be dark in the uh, in the spectrum that I would find now so let, let me repeat that once again if I have a source of light let us say from carbon carbon light from carbon arc lamp make that to pass through a medium or make that to pass through a, uh, a medium that has sodium and if I observe the spectra of the light that is emerging out of that medium, then I will find that there are two distinct dark lines in this spectrum. So these two dark lines correspond to the element sodium, which means that if there is some element that is present, then this element would absorb those, those specific wavelengths. So this is the line absorption, uh, this is the line absorption spectra. Now, when you look at the um, uh, spectra from solar system from the when we look at the solar spectrum then, then we find that there are some distinct dark lines over there in this for example in this case this, these are the Fraunhofer lines these are the dark lines that I find here so it's marked as A, B, C, D up through H now this tells me that 
this, 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 these uh, dark lines that I find in the solar spectrum are called Fraunhofer lines. So let me repeat that once again. The dark lines that I find, the dark lines that I find in the solar spectrum is what is known as Fraunhofer lines. So these lines indicate that the solar that the that the solar atmosphere has got these elements. So by looking at this, I can tell what are the elements that are available in the solar uh, atmosphere. Now, this is all we need to cover as far as uh, uh, uses of spectroscope is concerned. So the spectroscope helps me in identifying the elements that are available at the source. It helps me. Uh, it helps me in uh, analyzing. What are, the, um, uh, what are the elements that are available in the atmosphere and then it also tells me how, how it also gives me an idea of what is the concentration of the may of the source when I am looking at line emission spectrum by looking at the intensity I can tell how concentrated is that source in the first place so these are the advantages of um, uh, these are the uses of uh, spectroscope now after having seen talked about spectroscope let us move on to the last topic here, which is Raman effect. Now let us look at the Raman effect in some detail now. So Tyndall and, and Raleigh Tyndall and Raleigh the two scientists observed long back that when light passes through a transparent medium this is a transparent medium transparent and homogeneous when light passes through transparent and homogeneous medium a portion of the light so what you get over here is not this entire light but a portion of this light gets diffracted away and scattered So a portion of the light gets deflected away and scattered when light is passed through a transparent and homogeneous medium. So it's only the remaining light that comes out of the, from the other end. So this phenomena is known as Rayleigh effect. This is known as Rayleigh effect. And this is called as Rayleigh scattering. So Rayleigh also showed that the intensity of the reflection, the intensity of reflect or deflected light, light is inversely proportional to the fourth power, is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength of the incident light. So Rayleigh showed that the intensity of the deflected light is direct, is proportional or in, is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength of the incident light. So this is about this is called as Rayleigh scattering. So let me repeat that once again. Incident beam of light when it when it passes through a transparent and homogeneous medium, it is observed that not all the rays of light come out at the other end, but a part of that gets scattered and deflected away towards the towards the sides. So the part of the rays gets deflected away towards the side and the intensity of deflection, deflected light is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength of, of the incident wavelength and this is known as Rayleigh scattering. So with, with this explanation, with this um, in mind, Rayleigh in the year 1871 was successfully able to explain why we see blue in the sky 
why we, why we see the sky as blue. And now based on this and sub with subsequent um, experiments, this is when Raman started working on his, uh, uh, on his um, experiments. He started working on his experiments. So in 1928, in 1928, Raman was studying, this was in the year 1871, 1871, Raleigh explained the blue, the, the gave a correct explanation for the blue color of the sky and in 1928 and in 1928 Raman was studying the scattering of light by liquids with the intention of reproducing such a natural phenomena as the blue color and this is when he's passing beam of light a beam of light through liquids such as toluene or benzene. He used benzene as a medium and subsequently he used toluene as a medium. So what he observed was when he passed a beam of monochromatic light, when he passed a beam of monochromatic light, so there was a scattering of light even in this case as observed by uh, Raleigh. But in this, but in this case of Rayleigh scattering, what is what what Rayleigh found was that this scattered light had the same wavelength as the incident light. So, if the incident uh, light had some wavelength lambda, then the scattered light had the same wavelength. So, in this context, Rayleigh scattering is called as coherent scattering because the wavelength of the scattered light is the same as wavelength of the incident light. The difference between this and Raman scattering is that Raman found that when he had a when he had the monochromatic light fall pass through liquids such as toluene or benzene, then there was scattering observed, pretty similar to what Rayleigh observed here. But in this case, the scattered light, the scat if this was lambda was a wavelength, then the scattered light had wavelengths lambda plus delta and lambda and then lambda minus delta. So in the case of Raman effect, Raman found that if when you pass a monochromatic light through liquids such as benzene and toluene, the last, there is a scattering of light sideways, but the scattered light had also the, had the incident had a uh, had a light that had the incident wavelength equal to the incident wavelength, but it also had two other wavelength two other lines corresponding to lambda plus delta and lambda minus delta. So there were. The scattered light contained higher and lower frequencies in addition to that of the higher and lower frequencies in addition to that of the incident light. And this phenomenon is called as Raman effect. And Raman was awarded Nobel Prize in 1930 for this effort. So as we observed that this Rayleigh scattering is called coherent scattering because the scattered light has the same wavelength as the incident light. Whereas Raman scattering, Raman effect is, has, is called as incoherent scattering because the scattered light has got frequency equal to the one that is incident on that plus the two other uh, uh, frequencies, one less than that and one greater than the incident frequency. So Raman effect is called incoherent scattering, Rayleigh effect has got, is called, Rayleigh scattering is called coherent scattering. Now, one of the chief um, uses of uh, Raman effect is in understanding the molecular structure. So, if somebody asks you what is the use of Raman effect, you can just tell them that it is used to find out the um, structure of molecules. And now with this, we come to an end of this uh, uh, unit, unit 8. Thank you.